Christmas. It's the Defenders. <laughs> it's the Defenders. And what is the sound of one fist defending? We don't have to worry, because in this world of darkness, there is more than one fist. Welcome to the Don't Get Defensive Podcast. <laughs> Hey, Maz, welcome to the palette of colors that is Don't Get Defensive. Mm. Indeed. Uh, I'm Good your to host, be Charlie, the Professor S. And with me, as always, is my skinny, rich friend. It's Maz. Hey, Maz, welcome back to mm. our very abbreviated <laughs> uh, Don't Get Defensive Defenders podcast. Um... You know, I said this uh, when I was watching the series of unfortunate events uh, Netflix show that the most unfortunate event was that it only lasted eight episodes. Yeah, I yeah. was not aware of that until I got to the last episode. Oh, I was like, yeah. wait a second, they only five episodes. What's happening here? Yeah, exactly, man. It is. It is a little disappointing, though. I will say they do tie up everything nicely in a bow. For sure. When we get to the end, and uh, what an ending. But we're not here to talk about the ending. We're Mm. here to talk about the beginning. Now, this is a spoilers podcast, which means every so often, Maz and I might drift in to what happens next. But we are going to try and focus on each episode as it is, where we were when we watched it, and Mm. what we thought about it. And maybe we'll say, and Neil, when we really saw what it was, then that was a big surprise. Um, That seems fair to me. That seems fair. Yeah, you know, we want to be fair. You know, and and there may be some old fogies out there still watching this, you know. (laughs) I only watch one episode a week because that's the way television was intended. (laughs) Don't make me question God. So tonight's episode, (laughs) The H Word. Uh, Matt Murdock, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Danny Rand investigate criminals and criminals and fight injustice, <laughs> unaware their paths are about to cross. Directed by S. J. Clarkson, written by Douglas Petrie and Marco Ramirez. Uh, they are the only guys who got writing credits this time. Um, we don't have a, a hardest working man in the show business yet, but I'm sure eventually we will. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, of course, Charlie Cox, Kristen Richer, Ritter, Mike Coulter, and oh, poor old mm. Iron Fist didn't get into the first cut. Got to go to the full cast and crew to see who played Iron Fist. Oh. Uh, yeah, poor Finn Jones. That's okay. <laughs> well, we're, we're gonna, we love him anyway. Well, I mean, uh, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I was... I was really happy, uh, surprisingly happy to, to hate on him again, get some more opportunities to hate on that character. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, you know, on the Capes and Lunatics podcast, oh, of which, um, you know, uh, the the various Netflix shows, we are on both feeds, I think, the uh, Capes and Lunatics, which I do with uh, Lilith Hellfire, um, uh, Philip Parrish, and uh, uh, Tyler Patrick. You know, we were discussing this, and we we kind of came to the understanding that essentially uh, the defenders is Seinfeld with punching. Huh. And yeah. if you break it down, each character does relate to a main character in Seinfeld. You have uh, Iron Fist, who is essentially the Kramer, the guy no one necessarily right. wants there, but you know somehow he does bring a lot of interesting things. He always talks about crazy stuff, and has such an odd relationship with money because he just sort of falls backwards into it, doesn't really have to work for it, never has a real job, but he's the Iron Fist. Um, (laughs) And then, of course, you have uh, Luke Cage, who is our Jerry. He is the, um, he's the guy who kind of is the most secure in his place in the world, knows who he is, knows what he wants, knows what he's doing, and kind of reacts to everyone else being crazy. You know, um... You know, Jessica Jones is, of course, uh, the Elaine. Uh, George. I don't know. I think she's the George. Well, no, we're going to get to the George in a minute. I'm going to explain why <laughs> Daredevil is the George. But Jessica's the Elaine because, first off, Elaine and uh, Jessica both had drinking problems. Um, 
And Jessica and Elaine both had uh, severe familial discord, like on an excessive level. Um, uh, I feel like George had a lot of familial discord. Well, except that George's family was there. So George's familial discord was something that was always in the show that you saw. Whereas Jessica's familial discord, you got like one episode in which you actually met her father and he's like this Ernest Hemingway type, but he's like very distant and absent in her life. Sort of in the way that Jessica's dead parents are kind of always absent in her life and are a defining characteristic. Um, I feel like the honoriness, the always being pissed off at the world sentiment lives in Jessica pretty, pretty hard. Yes, but you know what? I think that I think that Elaine also had that co- sort of attitude, that sort of sort of negative yeah. view at all the idiots around her. Yeah. You know, and what I'll say about the reason why Daredevil is George is first off, Daredevil very much um, is in conflict about his life, about his purpose, what is he supposed to do. He has a father figure that's always there, always taking him down, telling him how he's not really good enough. Mm. And uh, most importantly, what I always felt, what, what I think is the real thing, is when we get to like the uh, third or fourth episode, we get just the fact that the whole that Daredevil is the one who is always worried about his worlds colliding. Right. He's very obsessed with this is this world and that is that world. I have to keep them separate. I want this world to be this thing and that world to be that thing. And Daredevil is the one whose worlds are always colliding. He also mm. is always covering his head. Where that George tried to hide his baldness. That's all I'm saying. Um, you know, I can see it. I can see it. Daredevil does not want to reveal who he is to the world. So that is that is our theory that um, <laughs> that basically the Defenders is just Seinfeld, and of course, as in Seinfeld, <coughs> the city of New York is a very central character and very much informs the the story of of the characters, that they are all ruled by their neighborhoods. And one of the things I think that is essential about this show is that what we really get as we enter into this is the collision of worlds. Um, one of the things I think is most fascinating to me about this show is this first episode, the H word, word mm. is very much a set of different shows that have been stuck together Mm -hmm. so that when you watch each character's entrance the palette and sound cues are very much each show yeah exactly so when and you notice this when you go to luke cage because Mm -hmm. for what it's worth you know when iron fist is there when daredevil is there when jessica jones is there the the difference between red and blue and green is not as strong, and the music cues are relatively similar. And then as soon as Luke Cage walks in, you get that bright yellow, you get yeah. the hip hop score, and you go, mm-hmm. oh wait, I see what they just did. And then you notice it for everybody else. Well, also because when the first scene we get is Jessica and Trish uh, walking down the street, so when you're presented with just that being your reality, you don't question it or think it's different than it's supposed to be. But the moment it switches over to the next person being introduced, immediately that's that bright yellow, and and, and you're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, well, you know, for what it's worth, I think that there is something to be said about that, about how you just think it's your world. You right. know, um, uh, David A. Walker, who's one of uh, the great uh, comic book writers right now, has recently written a series called Superb, which has as its conceit this idea that all of the superpowered beings in that world are people of color. Oh. And while it's an interesting concept, it's, it, you know, it's like you can get it right and say, oh, well, oh, you're just saying, oh, people of color are all superpowered. It's like, and that's such a political statement, except why is that a political statement but the fact that in the regular comic book world, most of the people of with power are people without color. Or, or no one questions that. Sure. Yeah, no one questions that. So it's like, oh, you know, two two upper middle class women walking down the streets of New York talking. That's just normal. <laughs> well, I, I think the other is it just happenstance that more of the the um, um, I guess what's the word I'm looking for the brown or black people. 
are getting powers? What's the mechanism by which they're getting more power? Uh, oh, actually, I haven't read the book yet. I just know that's oh. the conceit. I just picked up issue two. Oh, I, you know, I'm a big fan of David A. Walker. He wrote um, he wrote the Nighthawk uh, book, which I loved. He wrote uh, Occupy Avengers, which was fantastic. He's actually writing, or he wrote, he wrote a recent Luke Cage series, which I didn't read, but uh, Phil read and swears by. Uh, so David A. Walker, he's one of the great writers of comic books currently out there. And he has this indie project called Superb, which I picked up. I've been wanting to. It was a real light week, so I got. So I only had like two actual books on my poll. So I picked mm-hmm. up Superb and I picked up um, uh, the Generations for the Marvel Generations uh, of Thor, which is Mighty Thor and Jane Foster, or, and or Mighty Thor and Unworthy Thor, or um, I coined that phrase, um, <laughs> or. Um, Jane Foster and Odin's son, depending on how how you want to how you want to slice that salami. Um, but anyway, so I haven't read it yet. I'm going to read it tomorrow. I'll talk about it on Capes and Lunatics, which by the time you hear this may have aired like two weeks ago. But I'm sure that Rob's <laughs> actually going to put up the Defenders cast pretty soon. So uh, I, nice, I have good. faith that because it's the Defenders, it's going to go up pretty quick. But we'll right. see how it all play, plays out. Uh, it should. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but actually, you know, one thing I'll say for the for the shortness of the eight episodes, we probably have time enough to do Daredevil season one if we want to go back to The Devil You Know season one. Yeah, I mean, the Punisher's not getting here till November, so I think that's a good call. Yeah, it might be an option. We will discuss yeah. that further after we get through these next eight episodes. Okay, so getting back to the actual episode. Um, uh. So Luke we'll... is getting out of jail, and uh, lo and behold, who's there helping him? Uh, Mr. Foggy Nelson. Yeah, Mr. Foggy Nelson. Isn't that a small world? Mm. But you know what I'll say about that is it makes sense if you consider the idea that superhuman law is an emerging mm. field of study. Right, and that's why Hogarth hired him. Exactly. Well, interesting... Makes you wonder if Hogarth knows more than she lets on. Oh. <laughs> you yeah. know, that it's like, oh, yeah, the devil of Hell's Kitchen and the blind lawyer who was your partner. Doesn't hire the partner because she knows he's a flipper to gibbet. Can't trust <laughs> him to show up at, at trial. But the guy who knows he's the flipper to gibbet, the guy who covers for him, that's the guy who understands superhuman law and is the guy we want on our team. Right. Uh, um, I will say this. That whole, you know, time with his with his long hair, I always thought it looked really dumb. But now that he cut it off, I'm like, damn, he should have not cut his hair. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing is when you look at um when you look at uh, the character of Foggy Nelson, you know, in the comics yeah. he was always kind of a dandy. Hmm. You know, and to the point that I actually always thought his conceit was that he was sort of the rich kid. Who who sort of supported Matt in the process? Now we definitely move away from that in um in this, um. But I always felt that was kind of the conceit in the original, which was that oh yeah he's he's the rich kid and and, and he's the one who funds Nelson and Murdoch so that and and Murdoch's the actual muscle behind it. But like sort of what we yeah. got in this is what we got in this, which I think is actually makes for a better story, is that they're both kind of blue color. Blue blue collar lawyers, but that Foggy's the actual guy who <clears throat> tries to focus on it. Right, um, and and you can't have you know the actual superhero also be good at his other job. You know what I mean? He's got to have some sort of flaw, otherwise he's not a hero. Yeah, although to that extent, we actually see, and this is this interesting concept to me, and we get into it elsewhere in the series, but mm-hmm. you know, Matt Murdock, when we see him in the opening here, he is. Winning a dramatic case uh. for some poor kid who was poisoned by shoddy building materials that apparently caused some sort of neurological damage that made him lose his, his legs. Right now, is he? Do you know if he? If they're hinting at him turning into somebody superhuman? You know, I was thinking about that. I don't think so. Oh, I don't right. think so. No, I mean just because. I mean. Uh, I forget his name. I think I googled it right after I saw it, and no one. Cared. <laughs> You know, right. um, for it's worth, David A. Walker recently brought back the character named Wheels Walensky, who is in a wheelchair, <laughs> who, right. who later becomes a character that I call 
Mr. Fantastic. But no one else calls him that yet. Although they kind of hinted that that's what he should be called, because they called the van that he was in the Fantastic, and it's sort of this sentient robot van that becomes sort of a... Oh, yeah. What do you call that thing where you're inside the robot that fights? A mech? A mech, yeah. It becomes like a, this giant mech, but it like starts out of his van, then turns into this mech, and oh, Will Walensky wow. is the guy inside it, but it's a super sentient like kit. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really cool. He he's a cool character, <laughs> it, very much like a transformer, Tristan. Um, in fact, you know the other thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting about the introduction to Matt we get is when he's in his apartment practicing his uh, you know little speech. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that he has a little braille printer. I thought that was a really really nice touch. Oh yeah, well of course because yeah. which actually you know it's an interesting thing with Matt Murdock. Um, you know, he can read print. They they said back in the old comics, he can read print uh, with his touch. Because his touch is so sensitive. He can just read the ink on the page. Um, Can't read uh, video screens yet. But, but, you know, they have him do Braille because it's a little more believable. It's a little harder to do the whole he can read with his fingers there. The only problem is that Braille is a very heavy print. There was something someone had pointed out, which is that um, if you see the book of Eli, that the Bible in Braille is actually like 14 volumes. So, wow. So, so the book he has with him couldn't possibly be the whole Bible. It's like, <laughs> it could only be like, you know, like the book of Genesis or something. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, but no, but it is very cool. He has the Braille printer, He, you know, and you can see him. And the point is to show that he's really working. And they make it that, nice. um, yeah. They give that little moment where he hears trouble outside, hears that, you know, feels that twinge of panic to like he needs to respond. And then the cops show up there and they take care of it and he's relieved. But, you know, he's still left with that little bit of tension and he doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. And it is this, it is an issue for Matt Mur- Murdock because, of course, yeah. he's a man who can do something. But at the same time, you're faced with this question, does he need to do it? And one of the things I think about this show as an overarching theme is that these are all street-level heroes. Right. But it raises this interesting question, I think, is do you need street-level heroes? Like, the guys that are out there on the street fighting this fight, are they really accomplishing something or are they actually just making things worse? And I think we'll get to this in episode two, but with this question of whether or not what we're seeing here with these, with these guys who are, I'm going to run in, I'm going to fight and be a hero, whether or not they're really being heroes or are they kind of maybe, you know, maybe not being heroes as much as they think they are. Maybe they're actually causing more problems than they, than they, than they think, um, and yeah. that maybe can't... I mean if you if you think about it, like if power, if everything in life is cyclical, so must power be cyclical. Mm-hmm. No, no. If so, so if somebody else comes into power, they'll change the system, but they'll build it up where other people will be able to live in it. I don't think anybody ever wants to change the system to the point to the point where everybody dies, right? So all they're doing is trying to change something. And if you're coming in there and having this sense of righteousness and wrecking it all, you're stopping the regular normal flow of energy and of life and of power and of how people live, right? Yes, you're Maybe. You're, break, you're breaking the flow of chi. Oh, see, this Ooh. is very much meant to be the the rest of the basically this is Defenders is in its own way intended to be the second half of the Iron Fist story. Mm. And I think we do get that. And to that extent, we meet here Alexandra mm. in a very uncomfortable position because, of course, uh as it turns out, she's dying. And yet, she seems relatively comfortable with this outcome, you know? She hears the yeah. doctor. And you see you see her wealth because it's like... Although, it also... One of the things I love about this scene is it shows, A, her wealth. 
Right. Because you see, you know, the silver tray for her jewelry and everything and how appointed everything is. Mm. And yet also the limitations of that wealth because mm, still going to die. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're still dying, lady. It doesn't matter <clears throat> how much you think you're going to, you know, it doesn't matter how rich you are, you're still going to die. Although. Maybe, but it's by her own hand, though, too, isn't it? Well, I mean, to the short extent. I mean, honestly, there's a bit of a retcon in all of this. Um, I don't know if we get it in this episode or if we get it in the ne- in a later episode that what is happening. In fact, I think it does take a couple episodes where we get the full reveal about yeah. what's happening here. But yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, she she is complicit in it. Although what I will say is, since we just watched season two, what's yeah. implied in that scene in season two. When you watch it in season two, I mean, I don't think it really jibes really? with what we're seeing. Well, yeah, because in season two, uh-huh. so spoilers here, kids. In season two of Daredevil, because this may <laughs> air before we do The Devil You Know season two. Um, in season two, um, at the very end of it, it's implied that what is being prepared is for Nobu. Not for, See, I, I, yeah. I never got that sense. I always thought it was being prepared for Electra. Oh, you did. See, I that's, always that's the impression I always got. Okay, so then, then that, then that, then you. So if we're assuming the writers knew what they were doing, mm. then you exactly got what they meant by all this. Because at the end she was in the case, so. Well, yeah, but it could, you know, that case could have been for Nobu just as easily. It comes to. Oh, the yeah, so in that of, the respect, it always could have been, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, but you know, as you mentioned it, I guess it makes a little more sense that if we assume a broader story, then yes, it was always meant for the Black Sky. And what they were saying is that if you happen to kill the Black Sky, don't worry, we can bring her back. Spoilers, yeah. the Black Sky gets brought back. If you haven't already seen it, <laughs> right. it was season two. Um, yes. Uh, Electra, the black sky gets resurrected from the dead. Um, and I do think she shows up in this episode. Although she's, yeah. oh, I mean, she opens really. what she opens the episode. Oh, well, well, yes, she opens the episode. Yes. Uh, she opens the episode in, uh, in the sewers. Yeah. The sewers of Fen was that Cambodia in Cambodia. Yeah. Fen- right. Cambodia. Cambodia. And um, fighting a white dude, because, you know, <laughs> if there's going to be a sword master in, Kendo, in Cambodia, it's probably some English guy. <laughs> you know? um, the, the other thing that really got me was, first of all, I, I mean, I, I appreciated that the series opened up with a scene of Danny Rand failing at something. Um, that, that was nice to see. But, like, he's walking into a situation. He's traveled halfway across the world to try to find some person. And... Like, he doesn't think to have his glow fist on. You know what I mean? It, it takes him so long after she kills the dude, he's there to find and protect. The world, but, All right, let me get my glow hand on. And, yeah, hmm, well, you know, not nothing, nothing. The, the, the iron fist is, I mean, it does take out of him. You know, okay. it's, it, you know I mean, the, the, the iron fist is his magic missile. And right. every wizard, when he walks into the darkness, wants to cast magic missile. Wants to go attack the darkness and cast magic missile. And the fact of the matter is, once you cast it, well, now you cast your magic missile. Now you're out of magic missile. So, okay, but even, even thinking about it from that perspective, like if he was like a football coach, he would not manage the game well. This is a guy who would forget to call timeout right before the, you know, the half oh, ends. Well, without a doubt, I mean, this is why Danny Rand is the Kramer. He right, is not, right, he's right. not a guy who thinks these things through. It winds up working out for him. That doesn't mean <laughs> that he actually had a plan the whole time. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, you 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 managed to survive that. You know, as, yeah. as, as the as the guy from, oh, what's it called? Uh, the Hangover says, but did you die? <laughs> you know, the other man doesn't die. He managed to get through, so it's okay. Yeah. Um, He's a guy that doesn't like live by plans he just lives in the moment he doesn't ever have any plans really that's why he's the kramer 
Yeah. Well, wow, make, yeah. He doesn't make plans, you know. He is <laughs> he he glides into your apartment unannounced. <laughs> he says, "Listen to me, Luke. I got this thing we got to do. Got to go fight the hand." <laughs> so, what? <laughs> Why are we fighting the hand? It doesn't matter. We've got to fight him. You know, I mean, this is the whole thing. This is the whole of the, and for what it's worth, that's the, that is the overarching idea is that Danny Rand yeah. actually, in all of his craziness, knows what's going on. He's actually predict, he actually knows, oh, this is going to happen and this is going to happen. <clears throat> We're going to have to do this and this is who we have to fight. And these are all the things that are going to play out over the, over the arcs. Um, but of course, a lot of this is also to give Danny Danny Rand his own arc. It's about him coming to accept that even though he is the Iron Fist, he needs help. Mm. Mm. And I do got to touch on this. How weirded out were you mm. by the Madame Gao Alexandra scenes? Yeah, that the first time when she comes and sit next sits next to her. I was like, whoa, wait a second, because they present Alexandra as this frail, older woman that's sort of, like, getting ready to die. She needs to, like, uh, get her affairs in order or something. And then Madame Gao, who's, like, this ultra-supreme, powerful, like, you know, being, and she's, like, cowering in front of her or, like, you know, begging. For, uh, man, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, you almost felt like... You almost felt bad for poor old Madame Gao there. Yeah. Um, you know, for what it's worth, you didn't feel nearly as bad when she was facing Bakudo in in Iron Fist. Because when she was facing Bakudo, you always felt like, oh, Bakudo's the junior partner here. Bakudo's right, just right. too big for her for his britches. And, you know, and Gao was just like, yeah, okay. Just shoot your load, dude, and then I'm gonna then I'm going to destroy you. Um, so a quick question here. Mm -hmm. Um so now the story is that over the centuries, uh, the five of them have been taking on new bodies over the centuries, right? No, and no, some no. of them have no, no, no. It's not new body. It's all the same bodies. So, so Alexander has been that body for however long she's been alive. Gao has had that body for supposedly centuries, correct? Presumably so. I mean, I guess maybe there's some. Youthening and agenting um, that goes on. I mean, we're, we're getting we're getting into spoilers territory here, but well, yeah, a little bit. But I think I mean maybe it's worth talking about a little bit. Um, yeah, because Bakudo is so much younger than oh, yeah. you know. So like, what is the explanation for that? Is well, if I'm going to give you an honest explanation, sure. <sighs> Alexandra and Gao uh -huh. aren't worried about the girlishness. Whereas the others mm. are very concerned about how they appear. Because right. the others are because of their because of their masculine nature, huh. they feel their power must be on display. Right. Whereas, and that's why they're nowhere near actual power. Well, exactly. I mean, if you really want to, if you really want to call a shelter after an entrenching tool, they are the ones that are always rushing in. They got, they want to get their hands dirty to show how manly they are. Meanwhile, right. Gao and Alexander are happy to sit back and say, "Go right ahead, Suatu. Go right uh, ahead, Bakudo. Go right ahead, uh, other guy who likes to fight bears. Um, <laughs> you know, go right ahead and get your hands dirty." And when hands get cut off, it won't be ours. You know? You yeah. know, we may go to jail for a few decades, you know, as you do. As as um as uh Gao once said, you know, she has spent, you know, lifetimes in jail already. She's not worried about being locked up back with uh when she was in the uh uh Iron Fist uh story and she was captured by Bakudo. You know, um you know, the fact of the matter is that she is sitting there and Alexandra is sitting there at the peak of the story because they are the people that are strong enough to survive. Mm. And they are strong enough to know the power of subtlety. You know, they're mm. essentially, they're the hand. And there are two things you can do with the hand. One is you can punch. The other is you can conceal. 
Oh. And if you punch, everyone's going to know what you're doing. But if you conceal, the whole point is no one knows what you're doing. And the one who conceals winds up in a better position than the one who punches. Um, one, one other point I want to touch on, um, the treatment. Okay. So the ep- this episode is called the H word. Now, funny, th- funny story, true story. When I saw the H word, I thought they were talking about H E double hockey sticks. Oh, interesting. and I thought that it was called the H word because the hand was digging or Alexandra was digging two H-E double hockey sticks to unleash some power. Um, And they're in Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, and they're in Hell's Kitchen. In truth, though, the H word, which actually gets called out by Jessica Jones very quickly, means hero. Mm. Mm. When she says, don't use the H word. And, of course, Luke Cage says, don't call me a hero. And and at the same time, and this is an interesting point about being a superhero, is that Matt's friends are trying to get him to kick the habit of being a superhero. Because they see how being a superhero is hurting him, hurts his life, and how he can do so much more good as a lawyer than as a superhero. By contrast, Patsy is very much encouraging Jessica, who, for what it's worth, her life is already kind of a train wreck. And is encouraging her to go into heroism because it will give her life meaning. Right. And the, it's an interesting thing that Jessica, who has a real substance abuse problem, should be a hero so that she can grow beyond her substance abuse problem. Whereas that Matt, who does not have a substance abuse problem, but just has a problem with being a hero mm. because it's too much to break away from. Yeah, but I mean, the, the other side of it is also maybe neither of his friends or anybody really, really get him. I mean, in certain, you know, later episodes, you kind of get that, that Foggy does. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I wonder if they're like not really understanding him or what he really needs to or wants to be. Well, to be fair, as I've always said, Matt Murdock never wanted to be a lawyer. That was his father's dream. He wanted to be a guy who gets punched like his dad, (laughs) you know, He's like, Dad, all I want to do is just get punched in the face just like you so I can grow up to be big and strong. And um, his dad was like, no, getting punched in the face, not nearly as much fun as you think. Uh, But that's what Matt wants. And, of course, you can't fight not necessarily your destiny, but what you really want. If something's what you want, you're going to do it regardless of if it's good for you or not. You know, and... Yeah, I mean, we've only got one life to live. We're all going to go, you know, back to where we came from at some point. What's the sense in not doing what you're supposed to be doing? Well, exactly. And to that extent, when we get the earthquake, which Mm. is caused by um, Alexandra pushing the timetable forward for whatever is going on over at Midland Circle... Mm-hmm. Um, which Gao warns her against because Gao says, look, hey, if we don't, if we move forward, we're moving forward. You know, we just worked this out so we could move forward at the slow pace we needed. Mm-hmm. And Alexander's like, I don't got that time. And I don't know if Gao says it, but I'm sure she's thinking it now because it's going to be said right out outright later. It's like, well, whose fault is that little mess? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Whose fault yeah. is that that you are dying now? It sure ain't, it sure ain't Gao and, uh, and, and, and others' fault. Yeah. It's your fault. And um, so she blows through something which causes a minor tremor throughout New York City, which causes panic. Um, and, and you know it's a minor tremor because nothing fell down. <laughs> you know, not for nothing, New York is built on a landfill. If there is ever a really significant earthquake in New York City, the whole city is gone. It is not built on bedrock. It is actually built on sand. It's just a very stable place in the on the planet, so there really aren't a lot of earthquakes here in New York. Um, but if if there is ever an earthquake in New York, most of Lower Manhattan falls into the falls into the harbor. It's going to move two feet to the left, and, you know, Manhattan can't deal with that. But anyway, um, so there is this big thing, and, of course, sends everyone into a panic. 
And Matt, hears the sound of people in trouble and knows no one's going to be there to help him. Right. And that is where we leave off this episode. Any final thoughts uh, tonight, Maz? Yeah, I think the other important thing to mention also is uh, what happens between Matt and Karen. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first we get introduced is right at the beginning when he walks out of winning his court case and Karen's there. And it's interesting, they're very distant from each other. Definitely seems like they haven't seen each other for a while. And then when they meet back up at the coffee shop, they're sitting together and he's still lying to her. The whole Mm -hmm. point of the end of last season was he told her and now, you know, maybe he can have something real. And now, again, he's just lying to her. And, and at first I was like, okay, you know what, just, just be open, like, the people that care about you should understand what you, who you really are, and yada, yada, yada. But the more the episode progressed, I got the sense that they really didn't want him to be doing this, and it's like, okay, that's just an untenable situation again, you know? Well, you know what, it is very much a parallel between um, uh, Tony Stark and Pepper Potts. Oh. Because you'll remember at the end of, of Iron Man 3, mm. uh... Pepper Potts basically tells him, you know, it's either me or Iron Man. Mm. And, you know, when we get to Age of Ultron, he's like, oh, no, Pepper couldn't be here. She's just so busy, yada, yada, yada. But when we get to um, uh, Civil War, he basically breaks down and says, no, you know, she said, it's her, the suit, and I chose the suit. And that's why Pepper's not here. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit undone in Homecoming, but they're, I guess they work through their problems, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe that's what we can expect for Karen and Daredevil, although, not for nothing, the end of the series kind of suggests a weird place to go from there. But that's something mm. we'll get to at the end of the series, and we're seven <laughs> episodes away from that. Um... <laughs> my, oh, uh, one last thing I want to mention is, uh, we get an interesting... Uh, speaking of going to a coffee shop, uh, mm. Luke does get coffee again. Oh, right. Indeed. And uh, you realize that of the four main protagonist females, Luke has had relationships with three. <laughs> right. People always talk about Claire Temple, uh, you know, having relationships with, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, like, Luke is really the one that's getting all around. Who, and then you throw it, Misty on top of that too. Yeah, who did Luke? Who did Claire have a relationship? Because I know, like, P- she was saying, almost, almost had something with with Matt Murdock and Daredevil. Well, yeah, almost, yeah, almost, <laughs> but not really. Yeah, well, it's, it yeah, just that's, like, that's my thing. It's like oh, <laughs> Maz for all the women I've almost had a relationship with. Uh, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> I might as well be Foggy Nelson on that record, you know. <laughs> Right, you know, right, right. And Foggy's almost had a relationship with Karen. You know, I mean, you know, uh-huh. and like, oh, hey, we like each other. Yeah. And let's leave it at that. Uh, but yeah, so Luke, Luke is with all three women in this series, and you know, the only one he had, the only two he hasn't had a relationship with are uh, Gao and Alexandra. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, we'll see where that leads in the next couple episodes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't want to spoil it, but yeah, there's always possibilities. Uh, yeah, it's a surprisingly small, very little cattiness between the three of them. Well, you know, I, what I'll say is, at least from Claire and Misty's point of view, is Misty kind of like had a had 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 literally a one night stand, right? That's so true. she was like, "Hey, look, you know, I've been there." It's nice. I'm not going to say it's not nice, and I'm not going to say I wouldn't be happy to yeah, <laughs> participate yeah. again. But I will say that you know, you know, uh, I'm not going to fault you for where you are. You know, right, and that's right. the truth of that. Is you know, not going to fault you. I get you. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then and I don't think that the other. I don't think anyone else has a whole thing with with. I don't think anyone else really has a conversation with Jessica on this subject. Although Claire uh-huh. probably know, actually Claire knows. Right. She's you know, that's what I'll say is Claire knows everybody that Luke has been with, and for what right. it's worth, maybe she's like, "Cool, like, yeah, he been he's been with the super powered and yeah. the tough gal." Yeah. But you know what? You know what he was waiting for? Right, right, right. Little old me. Yeah, so, nobody's immune to that uh, fantasy. 
Exactly. So anyway, uh, Maz, if folks would like to reach out to you and talk to you about, uh, if people would like to get defensive with you, Maz, mm. where can they yeah. find you? Uh, they can uh, email me at mazmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under mazmanzor. That's M O Z M A N Z O R. And of course, you can always write to me in that old fashioned email way, the way our Maz and Paws once said, at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's super connectivity blog, all one word, at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the Twitter to say live tweet. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. pretty soon, as well as uh, probably Legends of Tomorrow. It'll come back, and uh, hey, that Inhumans thing that might not be as horrible as everyone says. <laughs> and Charlie Esser, that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle for quality. All right, folks, that is the end of the Don't Get Defensive podcast. But remember, must get defensive. Try not to be offensive. Good night. <laughs>